Hey folks, welcome to the Eric Metaxas Show. I just happen to be Eric Metaxas. It's a coincidence, but it is the Eric Metaxas Show, so it's, it's not inappropriate that I would host it. Uh, let me just say that on this program, I usually get to interview interesting people. Today is one of those days. I'm sitting here with someone that I only met recently in Orlando, Florida. James Ward uh, is a pastor, author, entrepreneur, the author of a book that I'm holding here called Zero Victim, Overcoming Injustice with a New Attitude. James Ward, welcome. Thanks for having me, Eric. So good to be with you, sir. It, it was great to meet you. I met you uh, yeah. in Orlando at the NRB, and I, I just meet so many people at the NRB that it's dizzying. But every now and again, you meet somebody and you go, we, we have to connect. We really have to connect. So I'm, I'm glad that you happen to be in New York so we could actually connect in the studio, which is yep. the best of, of all. But your story is compelling. Uh, you write about it in the book, Zero Victim, Overcoming Injustice with a New Attitude. So I want to talk about your story. Mm -hmm. uh, tell my audience, you know, uh, how did you get here? Where did you start? Sure. You know, I, I grew up in the, in the South, uh, Eric. Um, I remember uh, distinctly uh, the, the tail end of uh, the school system being segregated. I remember in third grade in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which is my hometown. Uh, the first day of third grade, them busing uh, some of us black kids across town to the white side of, of town. And I don't remember seeing a white student or being in class with a white student before that. And so I thought that was going to be problematic, you know. Um, in the South during that time, you just kind of grow up with this inherent knowing. Um, these things, of course, are learned and you're conditioned from the culture around you. But grew up, grew up kind of knowing that black people and white people weren't really supposed to interact. And so I thought that this first day of going to this white school was going to be problematic. And uh, crossing the Black Warrior River to the white side of town, I noticed that there was a landscape change and the, the homes were nicer, the yards were, were, were well manicured. And I said, I, I belong on this side of town. So something was already stirring within me. So I get to class and um, thinking it was going to be a problem. I had a great teacher in third grade. She was a black lady. She would put our names on the board for uh, doing well in class, not for punitive reasons, but she would celebrate good behavior. Anytime you got a good grade on a spelling test, she would put your name on the board. And I started to notice, Ed, Eric, that my name was on the board quite often and something clicked within me, and I know it was the providence of God, I recognized that the white students weren't against me, that they were not holding me back from being successful. And the seed was planted in third grade that I stopped believing in black uh, and white supremacy because I stopped believing in black inferiority. And that was a pivotal moment in, in terms third of- grade. In that's third a, grade, that's an amazing thing yeah. uh, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, that's what you said. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Yeah. So yeah. So that's 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 interesting when you have that kind of just an experience that people can't take it away from you because you mm -hmm. lived it. You you got it. Um, but that I guess that started you on a journey. Yep. Uh, it, it sure sounds like it. But so well, then what happened after that? Right. So that that changed the the trajectory of of my life. And from that moment, um, I began to live life from the inside out and not from the outside in. And I think we can talk quite a bit in terms of, that's really God's design for humanity, to live life from the inside out, not from the life outside in. And I think that um, this idea of zero victim thinking, uh, couple that with faith, it's the mind of Jesus Christ himself. And I've discovered that, that two things are most formative in my life, and I think any person's life, faith in Jesus Christ and a zero victim mindset, which is really the mind of Christ, but also... Um, the mind that God intends for us to have. And if I could frame the, the zero victim mindset in terms of faith, yeah. um, which, is, which is so very much in a line and so much synergy with your message, your letter to the church and the things you've been saying, the idea of a zero victim mindset, think about this, Eric, the only um, innocent man that ever lived suffered the greatest injustice that the world has ever known. During this time, there are so many cries for, cries for justice and righteousness and those kinds of things. The only innocent man that ever lived suffer the greatest injustice that the world's ever known. And while in the process, still in the act of being victimized, he's already praying for forgiveness and releasing the power of love over the victimization that's taking place. So get this, he's actively dying for the men who are killing him while they are still in the process. And, and he, that's the power of love. It's the power of forgiveness that I believe 
the church overall and not being critical, I think we've deviated from the power of love that overcomes a multitude of sins, the power of forgiveness. And that is the zero victim mindset. Jesus was not a victim. And the word of God tells us that, that every Christian will call Romans 8, 29 to be conformed to the image of Christ, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I think this is the mind of Christ applied to the issues of our day that the church has a responsibility of communicating this message to society. When victimization now is being weaponized, uh, politicized, to, it's the soil from which uh, CRT, all of the divisive ideologies today is growing from uh, victim soil. And I think this is a message that the church has to deliver in terms of the mind of Christ and the gospel applied to well, the social yes, political yes. issues of our day. Uh, they, they are celebrating victimhood. Yep. It's a badge of honor. Who's the most victimized? And the fact of the matter is, you know, to cut to the chase, it's antichrist. In mm -hmm. other words, Absolutely. this is not neutral. There's something in it. And the reason that it's so demonic uh, is because it appeals to something in every one of us. In other mm -hmm. words, it, it's, it's very tempting for us to say, yes, I'm a victim. I've been hurt. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. And it might be true. Yeah. You have been hurt. But to receive that and then to let it feed one's anger mm -hmm. and resentment. Now, people wouldn't know this, uh, but I, I experienced this myself. I grew up in a working class home. My parents are European immigrants. When I got to Yale University, it was mm -hmm. the first time I was exposed to this ideology, which was in the 80s. But the ideology is the man, whoever it is, right? In other words, it's never you. It's some guy with money and power. They're oppressing you, and you need to hate them because you, you're the victim, mm -hmm. and you're the... And th think of the irony. Here you are at Yale University, but you're being fed this idea that they want to keep you down, right. right? And they are, you know, whatever it would be, the white establishment. Uh, since I was white, I guess it would be the WASP establishment, you know, uh, George Bush, Ronald Reagan, wh whatever it is. The point is that there was, there was this ideology there then, mm -hmm. which, was, which was being fed to me, and I was drinking this in. And I remember it vividly because I remember that feeling of like, it feels so good, I'm morally superior, that I can hate those yeah. people that are keeping me down. So I remember viscerally what that felt like. And I think to myself, my goodness, how difficult it would be for somebody growing up uh, in poverty as a black person in America, how difficult it would be to escape thinking that. Yeah. And, but you, uh, obviously, you didn't just escape that thinking, but but you are now helping people get past that. I want to remind people the book is called Zero Victim. I'm talking to James Ward. Um, so when did faith come into it for you? Because you said you had this experience in third grade, like, yep. hey, yep. I'm doing pretty well here. And uh, what, when, was faith part of your, your journey all the way through, or was that later? How did that work? Yeah, faith, faith was a part of my journey. I grew up in the, in the church and gave my life to the Lord when I was 12 years old. And it was, it was really a connection that was, that was made. Um, you know, the, the Romans 12, too, you know, being transformed by the renewing of your, of your mind. And I find it interesting that, um, you know, heaven touches earth, I like to say, at the point of the the human mind, you know, that's the conduit through which uh, the purposes of God on earth as it is in heaven. It has to fly, flow through a mindset mm. that is elastic and able to stretch to accommodate the greatness of God, you know, stretching even beyond uh, faith and understanding into the realm of the divine power of God. And so I was able to make that connection in terms of this mind being in you that was also in Christ Jesus, I believe. Uh, Philippians 3.13, forgetting those things that are behind. The Bible has a lot to say about how we think in terms of us living out and fleshing out our Christianity. Okay, now and that, so it felt like a connection was made for that, me. Uh, we've got a lot to unpack. I'm yeah. just thrilled to be sitting here with James Ward, the author of Zero Victim. We'll be right back. Yeah. Welcome back. I'm talking to James Ward, uh, who's the author of a book, Zero Victim. Overcoming Injustice with a New Attitude. James, you're the pastor and founder of Insight Church in the North Chicago suburb of Skokie. So you, uh, you started out in Alabama. Yep. And now you are in, how long have you been in Chicago? 
I uh, came to Chicago in 1993. Actually, uh, I graduated in 1993, went to college at DePaul, so I did my undergrad in, okay. uh, at DePaul University. Did you know you wanted to be a minister of the gospel? Did when you know where were where were you? What was your track? Where yeah. were you headed? Yeah, absolutely not. I was involved in the music industry. I actually got recruited uh, by DePaul University for music, and uh, that's how I ended up in Chicago. What, what music? Yeah, played jazz music. Was a jazz drummer, and ended up doing well. Wanted to be the next Quincy Jones or Bob Foster, and uh, believe it or not, in a nightclub in Boston. The Lord spoke to me, and I recommitted my life to the Lord. I, I lived in a period when I wanted Jesus to be Savior but not Lord of my life, and the Lord speaks to me uh, in a nightclub in Boston and says, I want your life. I knew the Lord was speaking to me. When I came back to Chicago, I said, well, now I need someone to uh, teach me and disciple me, and it was during that time that I was scanning uh, television channels and met a pastor, saw a pastor that was teaching the Word of God, and I said, this man can teach me how to be a man of God and how to be a Christian, uh, ended up finding his church and didn't know that I would end up marrying his daughter. Wow. And he would become my father-in-law, uh, Pastor Carlton. Does Arthur. your wife know yeah. this story? My wife She's knows. She's sitting right over here. She knows Are you story. serious? I think she prayed me out of that I was going to say, she that is really good. at all night prayer while I'm drinking and so, wow, carousing. Wow, 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 and so wow. here, here we are, and the Lord called me to ministry during that time. had no idea that I would be called to ministry. Yeah. So now we pastor a church with two campuses, one in Skokie, one in the south suburbs of uh, Tenley Park Insight Church. Great church, uh, multi-ethnic, multi-generational it, church. That's it's thriving. always fantastic to hear good news coming out of Chicago because Chicago <laughs> yeah. is one of those cities. Yeah. I've got a very dear friend, Bob Muzikowski, mm -hmm. who uh, runs a, a Christian uh, school in the inner city. And, uh, you know, you, you hear all the bad news, just like people yeah. who, when I tell them I live in New York, they're like, oh, New York, right? You know, because yeah. they're only hearing the bad news. We need to hear... The, 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 the good stories yeah. and the fact that you are pastoring these two churches in Chicago, I'm already uh, excited about yeah. what God is doing. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks so much. I was walking with our children the other day. They came up to New York to be with us for a few days, walking through the area and reminding them, Eric, Jesus is Lord of all. You know, Satan is temporarily in control. First John 5, 19, it so says that the world lies under the sway temporarily of the evil of the evil one but Jesus is in control and this is the time for Christians to be bold to be engaged to be emboldened by the truth of God's word and to uh, to really be light you know in a culture of darkness and uh, I think this 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 mindset this new way of thinking overcoming injustice knowing that God's grace is sufficient for whatever is happening today that where sin abound grace abounds much more I think we're the right people at the right time provisioned by God's grace to do exactly what needs to be done if we're willing to obey the Lord and to step out uh, with courage, you know, to, 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 to advance his kingdom. And, of course, it's important to say what we said earlier that, you know, critical race theory and this victim ideology is not just wrong. Yeah. Uh, it's antithetical to the scripture. Mm -hmm. It is antichrist, and it is harming people. Now, yeah. let's be clear. Yeah. The reason I speak against it, uh, and I have guests who speak against it, is because it is actually yeah. harming people. If yeah. you care about communities of color, yeah. you care about people struggling, you need to know yeah. this is not just not helping them, but this is a path to destruction. Yeah. Um, and I know that that's part of what you talk about in your book, Zero Victim. Yeah, it's it's not only harmful and destructive, destructive, it should be a problem for every Christ follower because it undermines the work of atonement. That ideology says that the blood of Jesus Christ is not sufficient for redemption for all sinners and for all mankind. It, it contradicts the, the New Testament term. You hear so much today about xenophobia. Well, the, the Greek New Testament term is philoxenia. It's love for the stranger. It's not fear of the stranger. It's Christian hospitality. And so that idea of CRT, it's non-redemptive. It undermines the work of the atonement, and it undermines the Christian doctrine and ideology of hospitality. If Jesus commands us to love our enemies, you cannot reconcile that, that, that truth and obedience, uh, obedience to that truth and hold this idea of critical race theory and not understand the power of the blood of Jesus Christ to redeem, to redeem all humanity. It is, yeah. I, the, w one of the ways that I see critical race theory and all cultural Marxism, it is fatalistic. Yeah. And that's the voice of the devil. The voice of the devil says, you will never, you can never yeah. overcome these things. If you're white, you're guilty. Uh, if you're black, you're oppressed. 
If you're, in other words, these are stated like facts, immutable facts, wipe, totally wiping out the possibilities of God redeeming and changing. And, and, and that fatalism um, really is the voice of the devil, yeah. is to say to somebody, you will never change. And I even talk about it as, as applies to the United States of America. It's like saying, like, you're a cursed country. You're cursed from the beginning. You're cursed from 1619. That's the lie of the 1619 yeah. Project. Yeah. And you can never change. And that's like telling a child, you can never change. You're just like your horrible mother. You're just like your horrible father. That's who you are. It is a curse. You are, you're cursing someone as opposed to loving them and freeing them and blessing them. Yep, yep. The transformative power of the love of God, a heart that is tempered and defined and fortified by the love of God, and a mind that is tempered with a zero victim mentality. I tell our church this all the time. Whoever the grand dragon or the grand wizard of the KKK, the highest guy, I, I love him, Eric. I don't know who he is. Regardless of what he does, I love him. I don't condone his behavior, but I love him because the love of Christ in me, there's something in me that's greater toward him than his, his hatred and his misunderstanding and his attempt to label or to define me. That's the power of Christ. That's the power of the gospel. And there's, what we're dealing with today is ideological warfare. Um, it's a new civil war of truth versus darkness. Not new, but righteousness versus un unrighteousness. This is not a skin problem. It's a sin problem. It's a heart problem. It's a Matthew chapter 7, Mark chapter 7 problem. When Jesus says that evil and murder and all these things proceed from the human heart, go back to the days of Cain and Abel. When Cain killed his own brother Abel, there was no, no race there. You're talking about evil, sin crouching at his door uh, to cause him to destroy someone born from his own mother's womb. So, of course, you're going to have problems with uh, uh, the enemy manipulating people to use race and division and those kinds of things. But it's an internal problem. The challenge with America today is we're not building better people. We talk so much about external stimulus. We talk so much about systematic issues and systemic sins. We're not dealing with the heart and the depravity of spiritual and moral uh, deprivation that's taking place in the human heart. And we have to, we have to address these things there. And listen, let's, let's, uh, let's be honest and clear. The temptation to blame someone else, that's at the very heart of what it is to be a fallen, broken, sinful human being, that we yeah. love the idea that we can find someone yeah. else to say it yeah. is his fault, it is her fault, it is their fault. Mm -hmm. And you see this all through history. It doesn't always fall along racial lines, but uh, it's very convenient, you know, when, when everyone uh, in Germany uh, can say, it's the Jews. Yeah. Simple. It's the Jews. It alleviates you uh, from having to look at things honestly. You create a scapegoat, and that's what human beings do over and over and over again. Um, and you see blacks doing it with blacks, what we saw what happened in Rwanda. I mean, as, yeah. as demonic and murderous as anything we've ever seen, blacks murdering blacks, demonizing mm -hmm. blacks. So this is the human condition. Just as you said, this is the sin condition. No human being can escape it yeah. apart from Jesus. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's a, a term, self apotheosis. It's the, the heightened self. We're, we're living in a time of self-indulgence, selfishness, self-love. I find it very interesting that, of course, um, you know, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, for example, Paul says in the last days, perilous times, calipos or demon-filled times are going to come. One of the most important characteristics of demon-filled times in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. That's the, the absolute antithesis of Jesus telling us to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. You see this expression of, of demonic influence upon humanity that people are becoming lovers of themselves. And when you become a lover of yourself and you're in this self-apotheosis state, you will live in terms of, of a life that's victimized. It will always be about what they have done to me. And we're not dealing with the spiritual roots and the spiritual reality of what's happening in our society today. This is not a, a social, socio-political part, part problem or government problem. It's a heart issue. It's fascinating because since I'm Greek, I know the word apotheosis uh, really means to, to make a god. Mm -hmm. So self-apotheosis says, yeah. I am God. Yeah. Where do we hear that for the first time? Lucifer. You can be as gods in the Garden of Eden right in the beginning. And the, yeah. the demonic lie is forget about God. You can be God. 
And what does God say? God says we are to die to self, not to exalt self, uh, to deify the self. So you're, you're quite right. That's exactly what we're dealing with right now. Folks, we've got plenty more coming up. James Ward, W-A-R-D, Ward. The book is Zero, Victim, Overcoming Injustice with a New Attitude. Welcome back. I'm talking to the author of Zero Victim, James Ward. Uh, James, w- we've been living through such a bizarre time uh, the last few years. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the way I see it, uh, blacks in America have just made these amazing strides. We even, I believe, somebody needs to check on this, uh, I believe we had a black president, maybe even for two terms, I believe. I could be getting that wrong. Um, and yet, the siren song of victimhood has never been louder, um, and we are treated to this narrative uh, over and over and over again with, with really irresponsible, foolish people like LeBron James saying things just like pouring gasoline on fire. And uh, you stand strongly against that. Um, but particularly in a place like Chicago, it seems to me that that would be difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a different mindset. It's, it's countercultural. I'm reminded of Jesus' prayer for every believer in John chapter 17. Of course, we're in the world and he says, Father, I, don't, I pray that you don't, I'm not praying for you to take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil one. Keep them from the, the influence of the evil one, you know, and Satan, he attacks the mind. Uh, for Jesus to turn to his, you know, maybe his top disciple and tell him, get thee behind me, Satan. And he explains, Peter, you're not mindful of the things of God. So again, going back to the power of zero victim thinking and, and a transformed mind, um, it's essential for the gospel to work in our lives. I, I, I think about just a different mindset, you know, that I, I tell folks all the time, I am a Christian black American man. I'm not, not defined by the color of my, by, by my skin. You know, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ follower. I, I tell folks I'm, I'm more Jewish than anything as the seed of Abraham. And I, and I think that allowing the culture to feed us the narrative concerning who we are, this time of ideo- ideological warfare, is poisonous to the mind, and Jesus came to teach a countercultural mindset, a countercultural message. I think that the the black church, I think we have tremendous potential to help spawn a revival in society today with the love of Christ and the zero victim mindset. Think about the teachings of Jesus. I'll give you just one example. Uh, Matthew chapter five. Jesus says that that um, do not resist your enemy. That's a that's a very important statement. But one of the things he says is this, if, if, if they compel you, if your oppressor compels you to go one mile, Jesus says to go two miles. In other words, the first mile, if you're feeling victimized, there's something great from the power of God, by the Spirit of God, that the second mile becomes voluntary, whereas the first mile was victimization. And I, I think that mindset that if we could say, you know what, okay, first 400 years were pretty tough. There has been some oppression, some oppression and some injustice. Okay, we were compelled to go one mile, but you know what? This second 400 years, we're going to voluntarily serve America. Faith, uh, the power to be resilient, to recover, the, the power and the faith to stand on God's word and believe God through circumstances, I believe that can kickstart a revival in America. I think there's a tremendous opportunity uh, for us to communicate the redemptive power of the, of the gospel. Now, I know that uh, in 2020, when we saw the BLM riots and the, just the lunacy across America, people are trying to figure out what to make of it, you somehow managed to get on CNN and to deliver a message of sanity amidst the lunacy. How did that happen? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, you know, we happen to be the, uh, the pastors of uh, Julia Jackson, and Julia Jackson is the mother of of Jacob Blake, the young man who was shot in Kenosha, Wisconsin on August 23rd of 2020. There was a second shooting, remember, after George Floyd and Kenosha was burning oh, yeah. the streets oh, on, yeah. fire, on fire. Julia has been on our intercessory prayer team for many years, and her mother has been a part of our church and, and the, 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 the church of Sharon's father. So when Jacob was shot on that Sunday, Sunday evening, the first phone call that she made was to, to Sharon and I as her pastors to pray. And we pray that Jacob would live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. And that brought us into being involved with the the press conference. Julia asked us to be involved. I want to say that today Jacob is serving the Lord 
He's a great father to his children. You know what? On coming to this building, there's a mural outside that says Black Lives Matter, has all these names listed, and I noticed that Jacob's name is not listed. One of the things I can say, Jacob is a man of faith. He believes God's, God's word. He's not a victim. I don't think they had any use for his narrative, but it's the power of, again, the gospel and faith in Jesus Christ. And that landed us, again, uh, on the press conference to share um, this message of zero victim thinking, which I just recently updated, something I believe is a message for America. And a few days later, uh, get a call from the White House, from you know President Trump saying, I need your help. And that really kind of opened the door and began to kind of set a, a, a stage for this message to really begin to reverberate around, around the nation that I think it's for America right now. It calls people out of the polarization, out of the tribalism, back to the 50-yard line to have some civil discourse and to get back to some common sense thinking to what I believe is the, the moral majority that's still still out there. I mean, listen, I think people are very hungry for that yeah. because they just say this is, this is fatiguing, this is depressing, what is happening. Uh, we need common sense. We need truth. Yeah. Uh, we need hope. Um, now, so if somebody lives in the Chicago area, how do they connect with you at uh, your church? Yep, just insightchurch.org is our website. We're in the, uh, the towns, again, of Skokie and also Tenley Park is our main campus. Um, insightchurch.org is the way to get connected to Insight us. Insight Church. And can people watch you online as well? Yep, we're online. Um, you can go to zerovictim.com as well to pick up some information about the book, but we're all over social media. Uh, a lot of good things are happening right. with the okay. ministry. All right, we'll be back. Final segment with the author of Zero Victim, James Ward. Don't go away. Hey, folks, welcome back. I'm talking to the author of Zero Victim, Overcoming Injustice with a New Attitude, James Ward. James Ward, that new attitude is a Jesus attitude. There's no way around it. Yep. This yep. is not just positive thinking. Uh, it's a Jesus attitude because it's radical. Yep. When you pray for your enemies, when you love your enemies, uh, we cannot do that in our own strength. And it's no wonder that so many people kind of fall into this abyss uh, of uh, really self-pity, uh, buying the victimization attitude, because really apart from Jesus, there is no clear way out of this conundrum. We're talking about sin. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I, you mentioned the word radical and, um, you know, using... That idea, um, Jesus was radical when it came to unrighteousness and the godlessness of the culture. I sometimes tell tell you know folks we work in and out of the D.C. area uh, that even today I think we we've made the mistake of allowing even conservatism to at least feel like a replacement theology for true Christianity, and we have to remind ourselves that God is neither Democrat nor Republican. This is a kingdom ideology. You know, we're not here to be on the left or the right, but to call people from the left and the right above into, into the kingdom of God. And I sometimes say that the, the, the problem with just conservatism and the ideology is that people who are radical will always dominate and defeat people who are conservatives for this reason. Conservative people who have nothing to gain and everything to lose will always be defeated by people who have nothing to lose and everything to gain. And I think that many of the voices and the ideologies of unrighteousness today are more radical uh, concerning unrighteousness than the church is concerning righteousness. And so we need a, we need a shift of, of mindset. Uh, the violent are going to take and advance the kingdom of God. That's, fa force. that's a fascinating yeah. way of putting it, because, and it also depends how you define conservatism, but yeah. let's be honest, I mean, I am conservative, but there are plenty of conservatives that are not Christian, they don't have Christian uh, values running all the way through, they picked up some principles that I would agree with, but it is important that people who love Jesus are influencing the conservative movement more yeah. than the conservative movement is influencing the yep. church. Yep. Um, and what you just said about like the desperation i mean if 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 i'm living in a bad situation i'm hopeless it is natural to just go to anything that is offering you a way out even if it's a false path you you you're 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 inclined toward that more than you're inclined to the status quo what if the status quo is not working very well yep. for you yep. and so that's an interesting thing that we are called as christians to be radical 
And I mean, I talk about this a lot in my book, or at least I talk about it a lot when I'm speaking, but it comes out of my book, Letter to the American Church, this idea that we're supposed to be on offense. Mm -hmm. We're not just supposed to be like, well, here we are, everything's okay. Everything is not okay. Right. And we need to be on the march to bring God into every single sphere and yep. stop keeping God in the churches and bring the church out into every sphere and bring those values out because without God, we cannot solve society's problems. Yep. I mean, the idea that we could is foolish. It's been tried many times, and it doesn't only not solve the problem, but usually makes the problem somehow worse. Yeah, it does. I, I often say that the, the church's spiritual report card is the condition of the nation, not the size of our buildings or the size of our congregations. If we really want to know how well we are, uh, let's check how effective the light is being in dispelling the darkness and how effective the soft is, is being in preventing decay in society. And so if we really want to take an honest assessment of how we're doing um, and the, the veracity of our, of our Christianity and our faith, we have to look at society. Now, we know that scripturally that things are going to continue to, uh, to fall, and we know that the world is, is ultimately under, under God's judgment. Uh, but the agent of preservation and change, uh, the only institution that Jesus himself endorses and stands behind is the church of Jesus Christ, and we have to be engaged in the cultural issues of our day. We have to be engaged in the messiness of the of the day. I, I talk about this, this zero victim uh, message in the context of Christ in the cultural crisis. Uh, when we look at the fact that we're called to be ambassadors for Christ, you know, 2 Corinthians 5.20 or so, now then are we ambassadors for Christ? And it says that God is pleading through the church for the world to be reconciled unto God, the ministry and the word of reconciliation. We're called to stand in that, in that space and to, uh, to be repairers of the breach and restorers of the street to dwell in uh, if we're going to be true true to our faith. And you talk about the messiness of, of society. Um, I, I think, think back to uh, Viktor Frankl. I love his thinking, uh, Holocaust survivor. Um, he, he used this idea. Uh, he talks about space, that between the stimulus and the response is, is, is a space. And that's very much a zero victim uh, principle that I, I, I have adopted, that life is filled with stimulus. There are all kinds of problems and challenges in society. The world is a fallen place, perfectly designed to make victims out of us. But between a stimulus and our response or our reaction is that space that we get to decide not what happens to us, but how we respond or react what happens to us. I say that victim thinkers react by reflex, but zero victim thinkers respond by reason. And that's the difference between uh, having an I lose frame of ref reference versus having a mindset that you can engage and utilize the, the faculties that God has given us to change the situations that, that we're dealing with. It's interesting what you said about the, the, the report card. How do you put that? The, yeah. the, the church? The, the church's spiritual report card is the condition of the nation. That, which reminds me of uh, the person that I have written about and referenced in my new book, Letter to the American Church. Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously said, mm -hmm. the church is the conscience of the state. Yeah. In other words, it is the job of those who call themselves Christians uh, to speak truth, to act uh, lovingly, uh, to be the repairs of the breach, all of that stuff falls on the church. And we have many, many, many in the church today uh, who act as though, you know what, uh, I don't want to get involved. I just want to be, I want to be apolitical to the point where I want to be un inactive. I just want to be uh, doing my church thing, doing my theology thing, and that that doesn't reach out uh, beyond the church. That's just a theological thing. And we know it's just the opposite. It's supposed to reach everywhere. It's supposed to reach uh, into the culture. Um, we're, uh, we're done for this hour. We're going to drag you over into hour two. I hope uh, we have a few more minutes. Folks, we're talking to the author of Zero Victim, uh, James Ward. Stick around. Welcome back, folks. This is hour two. I continue my conversation with James Ward. The book is Zero Victim, Overcoming Injustice with a New Attitude. Um, so when did victimization become popular, uh, you know, in, on the left, in the black community on the left? Because I know that Dr. King was never 
preaching victimization. This is something that has crept in in the latter decades, and we see that it has not worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think back often that um, no one really picked up the mantle after uh, Dr. King's uh, death. I see, a, I see a void and a vacuum in our nation in the, uh, the spiritual and the socio-political space in the area of uh, where, where civil rights could have gone and should have gone after the uh, you know, post-Jim Crow era. Um, I like to say that um, with the zero victim message, Dr. King had a dream, but we have a vision. Uh, dreams happen when you're asleep, but vision happens when you're awakened. And I think that right now this uh, uh, idea that we don't need uh, to be woke, we don't need a cultural awakening, we need a spiritual awakening right now. And I think that really it begins with pastors like myself standing in the pulpit to speak boldly and to make disciples, true disciples of Christ. Um, uh, Jesus never, um, you know, pushed his kingdom to be involved. You read, read, for example, in the days of John the Baptist, you list all of the government officials that the word of the Lord came to John back in the wilderness. And so the word of God is, is, is always entrusted to the church. Let us hear what the spirit of God is saying to the church. And so I think the church is the agent of change and transformation. And it should be pastors uh, like myself and others who, who boldly preach that truth. I think it was, it was absolutely providential that Dr. King was also a pastor. He had a shepherd's heart. And, uh, you know, Sharon and I sense a, a calling to stand at that place to help uh, be America's zero victim pastors and to call our nation uh, back to um, this, this position of, of understanding that this is a spiritual issue that's happening in our nation. And there is an awakening that needs to, needs to take place around the challenges in our, in our nation. There's, there's three kinds of law that, that govern every nation. There's spiritual law, moral law and civil law. Wherever you go, whether it's, you know, Judaism or in, in Islamic nations, you know, you may have the Torah and Judaism. Uh, you'll have Sharia law in Islamic nations. There's always some kind of spiritual law, moral law, and civil law. I think here in America that we've abdicated our responsibility of communicating the primary importance of spiritual and moral law. We're most familiar with civil law or what we call constitutional law. I think we've kind of idolized, made the Constitution itself an, an idol, and we've kicked away the legs of spiritual and moral law, which are the more important kinds of law. Spiritual law, the law that God gives humanity, those can't change. Moral law is my ability to govern myself based upon spiritual, more, spiritual law. Civil law is no good without spiritual and moral law. And I think that we've, we've abdicated, again, that responsibility as the church to teach these kinds this of is, truths. It's kind of amazing you're saying this. And by amazing, I mean it must be the Holy Spirit. Because uh, I was just talking um, uh, yesterday with Hadley uh, Arcus, who's one of the finest uh, legal minds in America, and he is essentially making the same case in a different way, but uh, he, he talks, he doesn't talk about idolizing Constitution, but it's sort of the same thing. In other words, you, you say, listen, the Constitution is just the codification of what's already true. Yeah. If there was no Constitution, these things would still be true. Uh, and so if you focus on the, it's kind of like people who focus on the Bible so much that they forget about God. You think yeah. like, well, wait a minute, um, <laughs> these things are are true, there is no way around them, and you can miss the forest for the trees on, on some level. You know, it's, it would be like if somebody says, um, well, the Constitution doesn't say anything about this, or the Bible doesn't say anything about abortion. The Bible, and you're like, well, wait a minute. Um, it does and it doesn't. Just because it is not there in a verse you can grab out, that law exists. It is God's law, and it's implied. But it is interesting how people when you're just operating on the level of what are the uh, the civic laws, what are the laws, you, you forget that there is a moral law and that we have at times in this country when what the law of the land said was against the law of God. Mm -hmm. And we are called to obey the law of God. Yep. Uh, and obviously Dr. King writes about that in a letter, letter from the Birmingham jail. This is basic stuff. Uh, and, 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 and people do forget that if we have any good laws or if there's any goodness in the Constitution and there it's very good, it's beyond good, it's a, an extraordinary document, mm -hmm. but it comes 
from the law of God, from the moral law. Yeah, yeah. The weakness, the weakness of it is that you cannot legislate morality. It was not intended to make better people. It was not intended to make people good. You know, I have a good friend who was the police chief of, you know, the town in which one of our, our church campuses uh, exists, and I would tell him all the time, uh, Chief, if I can do my job, it'll make your job a whole lot easier. You won't, you won't have anyone to lock up. The jails will be empty if we can do what we're supposed to do spiritually and morally in society, and I think we're, we're, we're getting away from that. You know, yeah. it's fun to defund the police, do all these kinds of things. We're not, we're not building better people, Eric, I, and until we come back to that, there's not going to be any change. No, listen, I, I, I talk about the, what you're talking yeah. about a lot. I really do. I talk about the Golden Triangle of Freedom. I wrote a book called If You Can Keep It, uh, and it's Benjamin Franklin, in a sense, saying to this woman after they create the Constitution, she says, what have you given us, Dr. Franklin, a monarchy or a republic? He says, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. In other words, you, yeah. we the people, are the ones responsible for keeping the republic. This document... Uh, it's just a document if we don't live it out. And then Franklin and all the founders saw that when there was religious revival in the 13 colonies, yeah. crime went down, mm -hmm. domestic abuse went down, alcoholism went down, self-government and liberty went up. And you realize this is something that is necessary for freedom, for flourishing, and it cannot come from a document you know, the laws can tell you what not to do, but as you just said, they cannot force you yeah. to love your neighbor. They cannot force you to do good. Only God can do that. Yeah. And yeah. this is a vital, vital moment in America because I believe, as I think you do, that apart from revival, yeah. there is no hope. You right. have to have revival. Yeah. Revival right. is the basis yeah. for uh, our going forward and uh, yeah. for our getting uh, out of these problems. So it's... Yeah fascinating to me to, to think about that. And do you touch upon that in the, in the book, that issue of spiritual, moral, and... Uh, Ab absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What, what we don't realize is that godlessness inherently brings the curse on a society, that whenever we drive God out, it creates a vacuum. And that, that vacuum is always backfilled by unrighteousness, sin, wickedness, and immorality. And so uh, the effect of godliness, and we could talk even more, Romans chapter 28... Because they did not retain God in their knowledge, God handed them over to a debased mind. That term debased literally means to worthless morality. He handed them over to worthless, worthless morality. That's what we're seeing happening in America. The more we reject God, it's creating a vacuum, and he's handing our nation over to worthless morality. That is why we're seeing the explosion of, of, of gender dysphoria and transgenderism, and our drag, drag queens are teaching our children What's happening in society? We've rejected God. We didn't retain him in our knowledge, or at least we're, we're, we're moving in that direction. He's handing our nation over to a debased mind, over to worthless immorality. That's the problem with America today. And I think, Romans eight twenty eight. I think the Lord is allowing these horrible things to be manifested so that people will wake up, yep. so that people yep. will say, it is so nuts, there's got to be a better way. Yep. Uh, this is evil, God has to be the answer. And I really think things have gotten that bleak that lots of people that otherwise would just be drifting along yep. or looking for political solutions are realizing, no, no, no. First, we, we need to, to get back to God. Yep. We're out of time, but I, it's just been a joy speaking with you. Folks, I'm talking to James, have been talking to James Ward, the author of Zero Victim. You can go to zerovictim.com. Uh, and the church is Insight Church, which you can find at insightchurch.com. Org. Uh, James, God bless you. Thanks, Eric. It's been great. Thanks for having me. Folks, this is your daily reminder to please go to MyPillow.com or MyStore.com and to get huge savings, use the code ERIC. If you don't believe me, here are some celebrity friends. Mama said to use the code ERIC. Use the code ERIC. ERIC. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.